The following Truth Barista podcast is a High Beam Ministry production. Humans are masters of self-deception. We fool ourselves into believing things that are false, and we refuse to believe things that are true. I was in graduate school when I really started delving into the topic of self-deception, and it rocked my world. I saw it everywhere, in everyone. We lie to ourselves about the smallest details, such as how much we really ate today and why we didn't list our actual height and weight on our driver's license. <laughs> At the core, we lie to ourselves because we don't have enough psychological strength to admit the truth and deal with the consequences that will follow. That said, understanding our self-deception is the most effective way to live a fulfilling life. For when we admit who we really are, we have the opportunity to change. Welcome to the Airzatz Coffee Shop. This is Jay, your truth barista, and I'm serving up a steamy cup of God's truth for the average Joe. You can catch me and this podcast on my websites, truthbarista.com, all one word, truthbarista.com, and highbeamministry.com. That's H I G H B E A M ministry.com, as in car high beam. We're shining the light of God's truth on the road ahead. Truth Barista, I want to thank you. You know what I want to... Why? Why? Because you've helped me so much over the course of the last couple of years when we've sat down in this anointed booth with our coffee and our cream and our kolaches and whatever else, our Bibles. You made so much sense about the gospel. And and I know you're going to do that again today. But I just want to thank you about how you've impacted my life. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Shucks, folks, I'm speechless. Well, Larry, that's really flat. Thank you. I really appreciate that. Well, I think we have to give appreciation to those who are our spiritual teachers and helping us get closer to Jesus. You make good sense out of sometimes very difficult passages and concepts, and today we're going to talk about a couple more of those difficult sayings that we hear all the time in our culture. Well, I'd like to do that, not necessarily for the people, like, you know, that we talk or, you know, some of the people that I teach in classes. It's, it's a lot of it's for me, because I need to understand. Understand it. And I can't teach it if I don't understand it. And I'm a pretty simple guy. I mean, I don't like to... Seriously, I mean, I can listen to college professors drone on and on with big words and pretty much understand what they're saying. But, I mean, it's just I just need to have it simple for myself. And I believe that when Jesus came to reveal the fullness of God's Word, He put it in very simple, understandable terminology. Because as human beings, we're very simple people. We don't have, you know, not all of us run around with, you know, these vast intellects like some of these big eggheads do at the universities and seminaries. We just need to understand God in very simple terms. So, yeah, I think going through this list here is great. Great. Let's talk about some of these things and see how simple and concise and understandable we can make it so when somebody comes in, we have an answer. Now, going back to clarify what you mean by the list, you are going by a list that was written by a gentleman. Why don't you tell us what this article was that we're kind of referencing and using? Well, this is this was written by Larry Tomzak, and we talked about this last week, and he basically went through a lot of common beliefs that people have, you know, Things like, well, like what we're going to talk about and discuss in the booth today, man, is basically good, believing generally in God, that's enough. Jesus, oh, I just stay neutral on the subject. You know, that kind of stuff that he says a lot of people and even many Christians hold to but are really not the truth of the Bible. In fact, some of these beliefs are deadly spiritually because they keep you away from God or fail to show you that you need to come to God to be saved and how to be the person God wants you to be. Well, basically, all religions teach some kind of moral values or principles, but right. morals aren't enough. I mean, just because Judaism talks a lot about morals and the law, and, and it sets up some wisdom principles and values, but that's still not enough without Jesus. Because, as you said earlier, Truth Barista, you got to deal with the sin issue. So you, you can live morally, but you're still sinful. So what do you do with the sinful side? Exactly. Well, those two things are not mutually exclusive. They go together. That's the beauty of looking at the Torah or the law. 
let me back it up a bit. God saved Israel out of Egypt, and he said, okay, now you're going to be my people. This is how I want you to live. God gave Adam and Eve the way to live. He said, don't eat of the tree. You, you don't have the right to set your own moral standard. Then he goes to Noah and basically tells him the same thing. You know, this is the way I want you to live now that you've gotten off the ark. And then he talks to Abraham and he says, I've chosen Abraham in part because he's going to teach his family how I want people to live. So it's all about God trying to get people back on track after we got off track in Genesis 3. So you get to the Torah where Israel is gathered at Mount Sinai and God says, okay, my people, this is how I want you to live. And because Everybody seems to come up with exceptions. But what about this? But what about this? The simple law of do things my way gets expanded into, at last count, 613 laws showing God's moral standard, saying this is right, this is wrong. And as part of that Torah, that law, God says, and if you screw up, Here's how you deal with the screw-up and bring you back into my good graces from a state of rebellion. That's the sacrificial system. Well, I, I kind of understand the 613 laws, but I like the 10, the 10 commandments or 10 statements, whatever they're originally called. Let me ask you this, Truth Barista, before we get into this whole idea of sin, uh, the sin issue, if I only live by the Ten Commandments, could I be saved? Well, if you could do them perfectly, and the reason I say that is this, Adam had one law, do it my way. Okay. Noah had basically seven, they call them the Noahide laws. That's really the one commandment broken into seven parts. By the time you get to Mount Sinai, those seven have developed into ten, and then you can take those ten and expand them to 613. Do you wow. see how it goes? You're such a mathematician. Well, and this is really the case. I mean, how many times have you bought something like a toaster and then you bring it home and it has like a half a paragraph on how to operate it and it has eight pages on how not to operate it right right what do we call those stickers on items that tell you not to do something that's common sense ignore them <laughs> ignore them <laughs> you know as well as i do nobody reads any of that stuff right my wife does those... i have to clarify that my wife reads everything but okay. she's an exception to the rule okay well in our household we call those the lawyer labels. Oh, yeah. And the reason they're on there is some idiot did something that was not common sense, broke the normal and expected operating process for that device. So now to keep the company out of a lawsuit and to keep people from give it getting injured, they have to put the stupid lawyer label on there saying, this is right and all these other ways are wrong. If you avoid doing it all these other ways, you'll be just fine. Okay. Well, that's so, good. Okay, let's get back to that question, though, because I think, you know, you're getting there, but I'm still not hearing. This is where I'm going with All this. All right. Okay. The Ten Commandments, people say, well, what is stealing? Well, what is coveting? Well, what does it mean to break the Sabbath? What does it mean to disobey your parents or dishonor your parents? Well, then you go through the 613. You find out that the 613 are all kind of like theme and variations on the original 10. Then you can take the original 10 and split them into two categories. The first four are loving God, and the last six are loving people. Does that sound familiar? Well, it this does. was the test that Jesus was asked as a rabbi. Rabbi, what is the most important commandment? And he took two commandments, love God and love people. He welded them together and he said, loving God and loving people is the greatest commandment. Okay, I mean, I get the concept there, but okay. you still haven't brought into focus that without Jesus, there is no salvation. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And so even the rich young ruler was doing exactly what you're saying, right? He kept the commandments, he kept the law, but that wasn't enough according to Jesus, right? Or am I wrong? That's right. That's right. He told the guy, okay, take those things that are moving your heart away from God and deal with them, which was his riches. 
Jesus got to the heart of the matter. So let me put it this way. What causes people to violate God's standard? Their, their sin. heart. Right, okay. It's their heart. And it was the heart that turned away from God that caused people to disobey him originally, and that, violating his standard of right and wrong, is what is called sin. Now you have to deal with the sin issue if you're going to come back into God's presence. God said, on the day that you do this, in other words, rebel against him, you're going to die. Well, Adam and Eve moved into, so to speak, when they violated God's law, they moved into a state of death or separation from God. Now, the only way to overcome and eliminate that separation is to eliminate the sin issue. Somebody's got to pay the bill. Okay. okay, okay. That was done through the ceremonial laws of sacrifice, right? Right. Every soul that sins shall die, and there is no, as Hebrew says, there is no atoning for sin without blood. So, the writer of Hebrews is actually pointing back to the sacrificial system and says, and this is how they did it under the Mosaic Covenant, under the Sinai Covenant. God allowed animals to stand in for human beings. They, the animals gave up their life in place of a human giving up their life. And then the writer of Hebrews says, and by the way, the best sacrifice is not animals because it's not a perfect one-to-one. -one. It has to be a human life. And so rather than you giving up your life, God the Father says, I will send my son to give up his life. The payment's been made, sin has been eliminated, and now you can reconnect with God. Ding, 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 ding. The light went on, Truth Barista, in my mind, when you said it wasn't a perfect one-for-one. -one. An animal is not a human. Therefore, it's only so good. You know, it's a practice. It's a foreshadowing or whatever you want to call it, but it wasn't a fair deal, right? An animal right. isn't a human, so you can sacrifice animals all day long, but it's still not the same equivalency of a human being. I, I love <laughs> that. That, I, that is a truth, truth barista. And you know no. what I think we should do? Seriously, I, I think that is so insightful. I think we should pause and let that kind of, you know, marinate itself while we get some more coffee. Mmm, sounds good. Hi, this is Jay Christensen with High Beam Ministry. I want to thank you for listening to the Truth Barista podcast today, and I want to personally invite you to visit highbeamministry.com, highbeamministry.com, all one word, highbeamministry.com. You will find all sorts of resources for your individual study, for your small group study, for your church, for your, you know, if you need a message for a congregational meeting sometime. We've got all sorts of resources. We've got the articles that you can read that are fresh on a weekly basis. We have the Truth Barista podcast that comes up on a weekly basis. I have a Bible study I'm developing called Cruising Through the Bible, which will give you a synopsis of a Bible chapter and help walk you through it to help teach you on a very basic level what it's about. Soon we will be developing video classes that you can access online of entire series of Bible topics and Bible books. Just visit the website highbeamministry.com. If you're interested in attending an online class with us, just simply email us at highbeamministry at gmail.com. Once again, highbeamministry at gmail.com. All one word, highbeamministry at gmail.com. Love to hear from you. Okay, now are you still marinating over that? Well, that got that one I, sacrifice. I, well, thing? sure, because I think people always don't understand. They thought, well, Judaism had a sacrificial system, so they were atoning for sin. So, really, why do we need a Jesus? Why do we need a human? And 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 you just answered that perfectly. Well, let me put it this way. Let me put it in other terms, because you know we're going for the simple, right? This is like under the Mosaic Covenant, under the Sinai Covenant, God allowed animals to cover over sin and to deal with that issue and to make an atonement for sin, turning away his anger for sin from a person who sinned. Okay? This is like God saying, okay, under my economy, I will allow Canadian money to pay your debts in the United States. Now, well, let me actually, let me make it even more simple than that. Back in revolutionary war times, you were allowed to use English money, British money, to pay your debts. Once the United States became a nation, then that money went to the side and a new economy was created by which continental dollars were used as the exchange rate. So in a sense, the difference between the Moses economy 
and Jesus' economy, the currency of blood has been changed. The blood of animals doesn't work. It's not part of the financial system anymore. Only Jesus' blood can be used as the currency to pay the debt of sin. Oh, that's so good, Truth Barista. I want to ask one last question here before we get into our discussion on these other things, and that is, tell me in very simple terms, because that's what we're doing today. We're keeping it simple. Why is it so important for God to have blood? Now, I know without blood, there's no forgiveness of sins. I get that. Mm-hmm. And I and I get the sacrificial system of goats and, and animals and so forth, and I do get the understanding of Jesus on the cross. But why blood, Truth Barista? Why is that so important? for God to have to get rid of sin. When God created Adam and Eve, and I always go back to the beginning because it's it's very simple. He formed Adam out of the dust of the earth. So now what happened is you've got this dirt boy laying there on the ground, so to speak. What does it say in the text that God did to Adam to bring him alive? Do you remember? Boy, that's a good question. You're taxing my little brain. Okay. It says he blew into him. He gave him a spirit. This is his, in Hebrew, his nephesh. Okay. This is his soul. This is his life force. I this can, is okay. what Adam us. Remember last week we were talking about my experience seeing a dead body for the first time mm-hmm. as a kid. Right. And when I looked at that body, I knew something was missing. It was just laying there very, very still, but I sensed something was gone. Well, now as an adult, I realize I know what's gone. It's the person. It's the life force. In other words, that body in death is exactly like Adam before God breathed life into him. Okay. So God gave him life, and when Adam sinned, God demanded that life back. Do you get that? I do. So it's like if you sin, you surrender the most precious thing you have, which is your life, and you get separated from your body. And you get separated from me. So now the exchange, the original exchange, the most valuable thing is a life. Now, when a person sins, God says, you are worthy of surrendering your life at this moment. And the guy says, but I don't want to surrender my life. And God says, okay, I've got that covered. You can find another piece of currency out there that represents life. In fact, it so represents life, if you don't have it, you don't have life. That is blood. Ah, so it couldn't have been an inanimate object, you know, like a plant or a tree or something. It has to have blood or or life. Okay. Life has to pay the price for sin. The wages of sin is death. Another way of putting this is when you sin, you surrender your life. That's the deal. That's the original thing. On the day you do this, you will die. You are surrendering your life. So in order to keep from surrendering our lives, our gracious God says, I will let you keep your life if you will accept my offer. And here's my offer. I will allow this animal to give up its life. I will allow you to offer its life in place of yours. Do you accept that? And at Mount Sinai, the Jews said, the Hebrews said, yes, we will. That's the sacrificial system. The sacrificial system is the giving, the shedding of blood representing life in order to pay for sin and guilt. So it pays for sin. Once sin is paid for, guilt is erased, and the person continues to walk with God. So in other words, the greatest currency on earth is blood or life because it stands in for life. So for example, if you had a diamond, let's say they just dug up like the third hugest diamond in the world mm. just in the last couple of months in South Africa. The thing is massive. It looks like a softball. Okay. <laughs> wow. Everybody wants it. What are you going to pay for it? Well, oh, I got some Canadian money here. And they look at you and go, uh, no, that's not good enough. Okay. I got some euros here. Not good enough. What do you want? I want dollars and dollars only, okay? I'll give you these dollars, you give me the diamond. So now the person has exchanged dollars for diamonds. So now those dollars represent the diamond. The diamond represents those dollars. 
This is why in Hebrews and in Leviticus it says, the life is in the blood. It equates the two. So rather than taking your life from your body, God allows you to present an animal's blood to represent your life to atone, wipe out, sin. Once that's been paid, you can now walk into the presence of God. Wow, that is so good. Another question, because it it makes me think, well, okay, does that cover the soul as well? Because sometimes we think, well, people die in the physical body and that's it. There's no more nothing. But the soul that you talked about that was breathed into Adam is an eternal soul. So that doesn't die. So we're talking about a permanent solution to a permanent life, right? Or a permanent soul as we would say, but that's life, right? So, I mm-hmm. mean, the soul is is eternal. So we're not just talking about somebody dying after 70 years and that's it. And God's atoned me for 70 years. No, he's atoned you forever because the soul lives on. Talk about that for a minute. Okay. When a soul leaves a body and you just leave the body behind, what do you call that? Death. Okay. So death is a separation of the person from the body. When a person sins against God, that sinful person cannot be in God's presence. So God separates them from his presence. That is a death. That is a spiritual death. This is why it says in the scriptures, there's a person who dies once, in other words, is separated from his body. But if the sin issue isn't taken care of, they're separated from God for eternity. That's what the Bible calls the second death. That's Revelation 21.8, Truth Priest. I just read that. So the soul is eternal when it was created by God. So that eternal soul, if it's separated from God, that's where it's going to spend eternity is in this, this place of torment. Is that right? Right. And that it's not just the place of torment, it's being separated from God. If there's any torment that overrides any other torment in all of creation, both the spiritual and the physical world, it's not being, as they describe it, being burned up forever. It's being separated from God. That's the torment. And I would I would even say, yeah, as awful as hell is described to be, I think the worst part of that is the fact that the person is separated from God, knows they're separated from God, and has to be in that torment forever. Which might even feel like flames. <laughs> yeah. I mean, let's let's boil it down. It's painful. Yes. I mean, how many of us yes. have hit those painful points in life where we feel like God has abandoned us? Mm-hmm. It's extremely painful. It's distressing. It's it's a horrible feeling. And one of the best feelings in the world, one of the best experiences I've had are those times when I felt God's presence very close to me or very aware that he's near to me or that I feel connected to him, however you want to describe it. Those are wonderful, beautiful moments. And I thought, what would happen if God's presence left me forever. Mm. And this is David. I mean, this is, what is it? This would be Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of my salvation, and renew a right spirit spirit within me. David is talking about, God, don't separate me from your presence because of my sin. Deal with my sin so that I may stay with you. Hmm. Wow. This is a man who understood the joy of the Lord's salvation, saving him from an eternal destiny of death and saving him unto himself, preserving his life with God. This goes back to what we talked about last week when you said define salvation. What is being saved? That's what it is. I am being saved from an eternal destiny apart from God. I am being saved unto an eternal life with God. And the biggest lie we hear today is man is basically good. Okay, well, that's a human deception. The answer that God has to that is Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean? Fallen short of the glory of God means we've not lived up to his standard. Adam and Eve were created matching God's glory, his standard of what is right and what is wrong. The minute they turned away from that, they missed the mark. In fact, that's a great way of saying it because that's what it means in Hebrew. One of the the definitions of sin in Hebrew is you missed the mark. What's the mark? God's standard. Okay, so... 
here's my answer to this. When people come into the Erzatz coffee shop and they say, man, is basically good. I'm going, really? Seriously? No person who has taken a hard, honest look at humanity and human nature can possibly say that. I mean, come on. If I were to get into your head and your heart, you're going to tell me that you're basically good? I mean, I can look at you, Larry, and I can say, hmm, just let me have about two minutes in your head and heart. I'll tell you how good you are. Well, and if yeah. you do the same to me, you could say, uh, not so much. Dark places in there. <laughs> well, and that standard, Truth Barista, you know, God's standard, of course, is who he is. I mean, he is the standard. And God's standard today is Jesus Christ. Without him, we have nothing. I don't care how religious or good you think you are, you're never going to see the kingdom of God with out the acceptance of God's provision for sin, which is his son, Jesus Christ. Exactly. Now, so as to that question, man is basically good? Not after Genesis 3, because man is basically, human beings are basically not good. Why? We're selfish. We're self-focused. That's the issue. We want to do things our way for our pleasure at all times. And we can't do that because a lot of times our desires run against what God wants us to do, right? Oh, yes. For example, in our society, God says, this is how you have sex. This is how you are to talk. This is how you are to treat people. Well, tell you what, growing up, man, there was, you know, I wanted to have sex outside of marriage, okay? I want to curse people out when I get mad at them. I want to fly somebody the bird when I'm on the highway. These are not good ways. These are counter to how God wants us to treat people. Therefore, they have not lived up to his standard. They have broken his law. And we do it all the time, mm -hmm. every day, because man is not basically good. We are all selfish and self-focused. And that is why we need Jesus, because exactly. no matter how we boil this thing down, we need a Savior. End yeah. on that, Truth Baristas, and we'll come back next week with more of these deceptive ideas. But end on that. End on why Jesus needs to be in every heart and mind. Because not only does he deal with the sin issue and bring us back together with God, but when opening that pathway to God, part of the deal was not only will I save you from my sin, I'm going to give my Holy Spirit to live in you. In essence, Jesus is living in us now to change us from being self-focused and selfish people to be God-focused and God-aware people and to begin to act. See, it's not just to save us from something, right? Sin and death. It's to save us unto something obedience, approval of God, walking like him. And by the way, this fits into our message of discipleship. We've talked about that over the last couple of weeks. Discipleship is learning how God wants you to live now that he's opened the door and you've been reconnected with him. Done and done. That's the point. This is Jay, your Truth Barista. Thanks for listening to the Truth Barista podcast. The best way to find out when a new podcast drops is through RSS feed. Go to our website, look for the RSS button, press it, and then enter your email. You'll be notified when a new podcast drops. Thanks for listening. <laughs> <laughs>